Smart Ball for the Super NES by the ill-fated Sony ImageSoft, in association with System Saycom and a pre-Pokemon Game Freak. Yes, the same people responsible for Mendel Palace and Pulse Man on behalf of Hudson Soft and Sega, respectively. Circa 1991, or preferably 92. Before I proceed any further, I'm dedicating this to Brooklyn Interactive Group, Somerville Media Center, Boston 8-Bit, Boston Open Screen, Word Local Productions, Triple Yet Productions, I'm looking at you, Alex Derdarian, James Rolfe, Kieran Fallon, and Justin Silverman from Cinemassacre, Darman Studios, Jay Shetty, Life Lessons with Lewis, Vid Chronicles, Soul Snack, Nerd Caliber, Lauren Press Pizza, Rod Weber, and Emery Galen of 2020 The Dumpster Fire fame, Brentel Floss, Anime Boston, PAX East, Too Many Games, E3, ETU Animated Stories, My Story animated or msa for short women in film and video new england i'm looking at you aj labina bg mike erica trembley and finally daisy alicia from all fam with all that out of the way onto this game's overall plot which despite not being mentioned in game with the exception of its japanese counterpart jerry boy i intend to lay it down to the best of my knowledge anyway so it takes place in the mystical yet modern land of Kyleria, within which its inhabitants have been living in peace and harmony for many a millennia, and its sole ruler, King Jeffrey, is on the verge of retirement and a possible death. I know, tragic as all get out, right? All cockiness aside, in order to do so, however, retire that is, his last royal deed consists of passing the crown to one of his two sons, Jerry Bean, hence our main protagonist, who's also on the verge of tying the knot with the lovely Princess Wendy, aka Emmy, and intends to rule just like his dad with the right leadership qualities and constant day-to-day -day responsibilities. In spite of it all, however, his jealous-ass rival prick brother, Tom Bean, manages to team up with a bad wizard and transform Jerry into a gelatinous slime, thereby stealing away the aforementioned Wendy, aka Emmy. But there's no way in FUCK that Jerry will continue to put up with their horse shit, so it's off to that scornful-ass wizard's castle halfway across the world to turn the tables on those motherfucking cock-blocking pricks! As far as gameplay mechanics, talk about going from one extreme to another. Now we have a quirky platforming journey on our hands, predating even Treasure's Dynamite Heady and the aforementioned Pulse Man, hence that other Game Freak developed title by a few years, within which you're in control of the permanently transformed Blob Jerry, sliding, pounding, and hanging his way through every area like his slimy little ass depended on it, until the eventual confrontation against that douchey piss and bad wizard, and his prick-ass rival sibling Tom before him, in order to, nor I'm intended, reverse his bullshit-ass curse. For basic controls, the D-pad forces Jerry to migrate of his own free will on ground, up and down tall structures, and even through narrow passages, while B and A allow him to jump, X and Y allow him to harden Jerry's body, gluing him to walls and ceilings, thereby being capable of ascending and or descending against and under them respectively, akin to the spider ball in Metroid 2 Return of Samus, and or force him to dash while crawling, and L and R allow him to hurl specific weapons from within him, in occasional conjunction with the D-pad for aiming. The letters that spell out his name can be collected in whatever order you desire, and can be very easy to track down at first, but gets hella tricky further on throughout his path. Not only are two extra lives awarded upon rounding up all five lettered tiles, they're also used as checkpoints should you happen to get your ass handed to you in a goddamn saucer. Speaking of which, should any adversary happen to get the best of you, or if you get exposed to any environmental hazard, your ass is down one goddamn life! Regarding the items, which are spotted from every flower you come across, and occasionally regenerate every time you take off, by the by, the red spheres, referred to as balls, which by the way have fuck all to do with privates, are Jerry's introductory means of projectile attack, apart from his physical squatting and whipping abilities via his elongated limbs, the blue heart-shaped life icons replenish his health, the clear health up heart icons extend and max out Jerry's health, the iron spheres deal way more damage towards his rivals than the normal red variety, despite his dashing and jumping capabilities being temporarily disabled to fuck until discarding it. The jump icons permit Jerry to perform higher leaps, the seeds him in beanstalk vines in order to reach higher areas, akin to the always iconic Super Mario franchise, and as for the 1-up icons, it should be goddamn obvious what the fuck they provide. 
In terms of enemy casting and the overall stage-by-stage -stage itinerary, with the latter being made up of eight varying stages, each with two parts no less. There are multicolored rats, each with different behaviors and attitudes, constantly hovering birds are free to fly on, and birds made of flame, hopping pig heads, red and pink flame imps, miniature and giant living boulders, different types of fish, sand crabs, sandworms, cycloptic cacti, pokey, meet your new roommate, cycloptic spinning gears, horned dinosaurs, red beetles, rabbits, penguins, various aquatic life, swirling coins, living bombs, sadistic humans including chefs and ball and chain warriors, and various other out-of-place creatures mixed with those you typically see in real life all of which roam the grasslands, suburban ruins, the urban landscape and its neighboring underground sewer system, the forest landscape and its caves, the desert, both at day and night with its own nearby cave in between, the moon on both light and dark sides, an ocean world back on Earth, an arctic landscape and its nearby caves, and the waterfalls eventually leading up to the Bad Wizard's own castle. The bosses you go up against near the end of the second act of each area are no exception whatsoever either, all of whom will make your journey an absolute, never-ending, clusterfuck-worthy, shit-showcasing ass geyser should you happen to slip up, of course. A gigantic, punk-ass blue and pink bird that causes earthquakes and hurls spikes and the occasional yet useful red orbs in between, a swarm of twelve synchronized sparrows that disperse and assemble mid-screen and summon random fish out of nowhere, a towering humanoid with a metallic set of limbs, head, and a torso made of smoke before taking off for the moon on a rocket, a fan a reptilian in space arranged by constellations that hurls flames from his heart, a portly yet snazzy aqua green penguin that pukes red fish, a disgruntled polar bear armed with ice blocks, a massive mechanical fish that attacks from below with nothing but its fin saw and eventually dives from the waterfalls into the air. And finally, Tom Bean, Jerry's aforementioned jealous-ass, prick-ass excuse for a sibling, transformed into an even bigger orchid slime just like him, followed by the heartless, dickless, retarded-as-fuck, ass-ramming son of a motherfucking bitch bastard bad wizard himself, even introducing his towering shadow throughout the second half of his fight. More than ever, I shit you not, although this game was, and is supposed to be, geared towards the much younger audience, children that is, and the fact that there is supposed to be a well-balanced difficulty, grasping the overall hang of those basic physical techniques is key, as is formulating every manageable strategy against the majority of Jerry's vast plethora of obstacles and ongoing onslaughts of adversaries who make even Bowser's and Robotics legions look like motherfucking pre-kindergarteners. Anyhow, the usual over-the-top metaphors aside, at least the controls are adequate, albeit a trifle skewed due to the randomized mechanics when not only performing the fastest possible dashes, but also attempting to maintain Jerry's balance while on the smallest platforms or traveling vertically on walls while he's hardened, amongst a few commonly raised downsides, and the gameplay mechanics, while questionable and perplexing as fuck in certain aspects on which I intend to elaborate further, are far from a major ball buster. In regards to Smart Boss Challenge, just like with various other platformers at the time, it's at the very least tolerable, if once more perplexing, in terms of being fully aware of Jerry's variable migration speeds when normally crawling or making quick dashes while hardened, in spite of how astronomically heightened the chances are that you'll end up overshooting his leaps over tight gaps for momentum or unexpectedly exposing him to all forms of imminent hazards and or the manifold animal or otherworldly rivals he encounters. And what's more, when you're in tight, narrow sections of certain areas, or when managing to guide his diminutive, gelatinous ass out of the lowest pits, crevices, alcoves, and the like, Jerry may also end up being vanquished to a primordial shit puddle, ditto for the aforementioned end boss skirmishes when utilizing both Jerry's physical limbs and the right weapon items, not counting that fucking beanstalk summoning seed, of course, and keeping him out of harm's way by any fucking means necessary. Did I forget to mention that you're capable of forming the Red Spheres? Once again referred to us, and yeah, we all know where the Christ that's going. Every time they regenerate within the flowers until Jerry reaches his limit, and even hitching rides on traveling enemies whenever appropriate, akin to SMB2 aka Doki Doki Panic, hell, you can even swap between the Iron Sphere and the normal Red Spheres to alternate your projectile attacks, and when dealing with those fucking flame imps, you can even lure them to the water in the sewer area, hence stage 2A, in order to extinguish their incandescent asses, or watch the red and pink flame imps fuse together to materialize themselves to shit. But then again, you're still best off avoiding the broiling bastards elsewhere. 
All helpful hints aside, with the exception of one, please refer back to and take into account what I also mentioned about the collectible letters spelling out the main character's name, doubling as stage checkpoints, amongst those other earlier indicated hints, as you're given three lives at the start, more of which, yet again, are awarded upon not only snatching one-ups by themselves or upon toppling every end boss, but also rounding up those often recounted checkpoint letters and infinite continues, along with those aforementioned checkpoints, and the opportunity to nab a specific weapon and or weapon for a mandatory obstacle or eventual boss skirmish individually, should you happen to accidentally get rid of either of them. On the graphical forefront, even for an early 16-bit platformer, the presentation aspects are an irreversible bluntness, middle of the road, but still as colorful and cheerful as all the others. Jerry by himself, both as a slime and in human form during the opening demo cutscene in the Japanese counterpart Jerry Boy, and at the end regardless of region, isn't too motherfucking shabby either, though one may admit most of his animations are rather commonplace, especially when he's got a new weapon or item lodged within himself. More than him, the vast assorted cast of rivals he goes up against are far from redundant, nerf-pinching eyesores, but could have benefited more from further development and imagination, but are also nothing short of fearless either. While I've also been researching and hearing over and over how bland and uninspiring the varying myriad backgrounds are for each world Jerry traverses through, including but not limited to the moon, with the planet surface's Mode 7 rotation effects in action while Jerry treads through both sides of it, light and dark. Forgive any double standard horseshit in advance, but once again, I'm going on record stating the antithesis without even so much as thinking twice. All things considered, every exterior stage background could have also benefited from further detail improvements, but given the game's age, at least they have their own undeniably unique-ass thematic vibes attached to them, and then some. Music and sound-wise, orchestrated by Yasuhika Fukuda of Super Bomberman 2, 4, and 5, Wario Blast featuring Bomberman, and Poppin' Music 2 fame, in collaboration with the late Manabu Saito for the already defunct system Seikom, may God rest him, and Akira Yamaoka just before joining Konami on various projects starting with Contra Hardcore, Sparkster, both the Super NES and Genesis variations, the PC Engine and Sega CD versions of Snatcher, and most notably the Silent Hill franchise, and especially the TriStar live-action film based on the games, Rumble Roses, and also also, fun fact, he's also the still current sound director at Grasshopper Manufacture of Killer7 and No More Heroes fame. The bizarrely unique, mood variable soundtrack doesn't disappoint in the slightest. Starting with the triumphant opening title anthem and the film strip style stage select warp sequences between each area, certain miscellaneous themes contain a diverse mix of optimistic, edgy, and Cloud9 worthy ambiences that defy even the likes of Nobuo Uematsu, Yuzo Koshiro, Koji Kondo, Masatomo Miyamoto, Daisuke Ishiwatari, David Wise, Tommy Tallarico, Stuart Copeland, and others, with due unbreakable respect to those earlier referenced composers, and are anything but stale. The sound effects, as overly redundant as they can become over time, are tolerable at best, considering oh what a blatant sophomoric understatement I've just delivered. Yeah, see what the fuck I did there? Either way, before I wrap this all up, take note of my top 10 songs displayed at the left, with at least a couple of honorable mentions provided. Replay value-wise, although there's nothing else to comment on at this point, it's obvious why this particular quote-unquote middle-of-the-road platformer hasn't been getting as much acclaim and praise or notoriety unlike all the others, which for the time being, I won't bother to get into either. Despite a vast deal of potential for strategic and skill-based improvement in between each playthrough, involving the majority of every in-game tip I strongly suggest referring back to, in addition, as irrelevant as the following alteration is to this topic, why not point it out anyway? The area-specific sections where Jerry interacts with other normal human NPCs has been removed for this US release, with the exception of one area I discovered, but I humbly digress. Either way, notwithstanding all the commonly marveled flaws this game harbors, and as long as you're patient and stalwart enough to stomach every overwhelming stumbling block it hurls your way, it's no deep, dark secret that Smart Ball should be a definite must in any 16-bit library. Am I wrong? Am I? Cause God help you if you think so!
Before I forget, and yes, I'll keep this as brief as humanly fucking possible, there's a Japan-only sequel, Jerry Boy 2, featuring six new main protagonists, a multi-species gang of three boys, two girls, and their one and only dog. Which, despite being nearly complete, wasn't publicly released due to Sony and Nintendo's relationship, which of course eventually resulted in the launch of the original PlayStation, or PS1 if many may prefer. But there are beta ROMs of the game that exist, both the original Japanese version and of course a fan-translated English hack. So if you're curious enough to emulate it and show off, like I did and many others before, hey, go fucking nuts! Henceforth, what's my final verdict? I don't even need to reiterate over and over why this game never took off the way many others did. Apart from both a manga adaptation of the game that ran for a while, illustrated by Game Freak's own Ken Sugimori, complete with an extra mini-story, Jerry Girl, and that aforementioned partly complete yet cancelled Japan-only sequel, Jerry Boy 2, about which I also suggest referring back to, if you're a massive platformer addict, regardless of era, I cannot, in all honorable, steadfast conscience, recommend Smart Ball enough. Which, while it doesn't possess the equal charm and reverence like all the others, whose names, for the sake of my own sanity and everyone else's for that matter, won't be dropped, it at least has some balls, no pun intended, to make itself exclusive regardless of every other common trait. So what the hell are you waiting for, an upcoming half-assed Flubber remake? Get your ass out there and track this game down, even if you have to resort to the old quote-unquote online shopping routine, as it's kind of a bargain bin title, running a 6 to 26 big ones loose, or if you have to break your bank, if not too severely, 11 to 240 bucks complete in box. Or move on to something else, your choice, why should I stop or force anyone, right? Until then, this is the one and only Hardcore Retro Guide proudly signing off.